Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the COVID calls. I am your host, Ryan Pyle. And yes, I'm still here in Istanbul. Um, how are you guys doing today? One of the big questions. Oh, by the way, today is just me. Um, it's just going to be me today. I had a COVID call with someone, but they canceled. And now I'm just going to riff with you guys for a bit. And the topic today, in case you want to stick around, is the future of travel. Because uh, I've been doing so much press for Expedition Asia, which comes out uh, Tuesday, June 2nd, 10.50 p.m., Asia Pacific. Um, hi, Chi Che Tu from the Philippines. Nice to meet you. Oh, Chani's back in from Thailand. Chani was my guide in Expedition Asia, Thailand. She's awesome. She lives in Chiang Mai. Be sure to uh, watch Expedition Asia. Okay, I'm getting off track here. Um, today's topic, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna riff about the future of travel because I've been doing so much uh, press for Expedition Asia, which comes out on Discovery Channel the last couple, ooh, the last like two weeks. Um, basically, oh man, Matt Sturgeon just signed in. Matt, how are you, buddy? How are you? I miss you. We need to do one of these chats. Anyways, uh, I've been doing so much press for Expedition Asia and everyone's asking me about the future of travel, the future of travel, the future of travel. And of course, no one's traveling. So no one knows really, but I have some ideas. So I am going to talk about that. Matt, how much, how much single malt whiskey do I have to ship you in Toronto for you to do a COVID call with me and catch up? and just, just catch up in a very public way. Um, Sherwin won't do it, I already asked him. Um, anyways, so yeah, today I'm gonna just riff about the future of travel and uh, what I think some of the trends are gonna be moving forward because it's probably not gonna be that great for quite a long time. Um, and I've got some opinions on the topic. And uh, one thing that happened that was Really crazy, Maddie boy. I know it's only like 9 a.m. in the morning, Matt, but go gentle on the whiskey in the morning. Um, yeah, I did an interview this week with Sean Sakonofsky. Uh, he is a cyclist and a diet guru. And somehow <laughs> this interview that we did together just like two or three days ago, has had over 900,000 views on Instagram, which is a lot more than normal. Uh, I'm averaging somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 per COVID call. But this one with Sean Sakonofsky seemed to have gone through the roof. And he has about 70,000 followers. And I have about 90, 95,000 followers, 93,000 followers, something like that. But somehow this combination of the two of us, um, I don't know how the algorithms work, but I guess I need to get him back on. Ari, how you doing, buddy? I hope everything's safe in Miami. I look forward to chatting with you later in the week as well. Ari Goldberg, entrepreneur, long distance runner, and a business partner of mine as well. We're gonna catch up because he's actually been traveling in the US by plane. And, uh, and he went to New York and then he went back to uh, Florida a few days ago. And I wanna catch up because I saw him posting um, you know, he had to do like 14 day quarantine, I think. And I just want to ask him like what it was like just being on an airplane again, because that's what I'm going to talk about, uh, today. Uh, cause I haven't been on an airplane. I've been in Istanbul for, 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 for nine weeks now. And my little kitten that used to be like this big is now like this big. So, uh, he is growing fast. Okay, guys, let's get right into this. I'm going to riff on the future of travel. If you guys have any comments or questions, ask me and I'll deal with it. And you know what? I don't know. Somehow these always go an hour, whether I have a guest or not. You guys are such great uh, audience members and you guys are always so fun asking me questions and staying involved. And uh, I always appreciate it. So look, number one, I've got six or seven points. I do have some notes. I made some notes. Okay. Terrible handwriting, right? Yeah. It's like I'm a doctor, but not as smart. Um, okay, mobility matters. Point number one, mobility matters. This whole idea that we're going to stop traveling as a society or as a species is ridiculous. 
this whole idea that we're just going to live online in the future, I also think is ridiculous. Maybe like in a few hundred years, maybe something like the matrix or something like, I don't know, something else. But for, for the next like 10, 20 years, people are going to travel. And this whole idea that we can somehow live our lives completely online uh, and somehow that that's fulfilling, I feel is just crazy. And, and I know like everyone's using Zoom and Skype and WhatsApp and Instagram Live to communicate with everyone. And, and I think that's fine. And those are all useful technologies. And they're all really helpful to do business and stuff like that. But in my business, and you guys can comment if you want, in my business, I've never gotten a job from anyone that I didn't meet face to face. That, I think, is a fact. No one has ever commissioned me. Talk soon, Matt. Take care, buddy. I miss you. I hope all's well. <coughs> um, yeah, so I have never been paid by anyone to make any kind of television show or do any kind of corporate partnership or anything like that um, without meeting them face to face. Because that's your, and I'm going to swear now, like that's the bullshit meter. Like the bullshit meter is meeting someone face to face. Cause when you meet someone face to face, you can, you can assess them immediately. Like you, people have a certain like vibe to them and you can assess someone quite quickly and decide if they're trustworthy or not. And, and most people aren't, <laughs> that's a fact. Uh, so I think that, uh, the mobility matters. People will still travel to do business together. People will still travel all around the world for holidays. People will still want to see this world that we live in. And people will still have short vacation times. I think that's the, that's the biggest thing. Like if you, if you live and work in the United States, um, you only have like two or maybe three weeks holiday per year. So yeah, I mean, you can get in your car and drive to a national park and social distance and set up a tent and, and that's beautiful. But once you've done that, once, twice, three times, five times, then, then what do you do? And that the answer is like, yeah, you get on a plane um, and you probably go somewhere else. So these, you know, in, for Europeans, um, they have much longer vacations in general. And yeah, I mean, they might be able to like get a camper van or something and, and, and travel further. But I just feel like, look, <clears throat> mobility, matters and no matter what we are always going to be traveling we are always going to be doing things face to face uh once this once these respiratory viruses sort themselves out because covid19 is just one of many coronaviruses i guess so um if we can get a vaccine for this one or something like that and what happens when the next one comes and i guess we're all very receptive to respiratory viruses because we have to breathe in and out every day okay so mobility matters people will still travel everyone being online all the time is not that rewarding let's put it that way um people still will seek to have first person experiences people will still have to travel for business and let's just take a little tangent there and talk about business travel Business travel is going to have to lead us out of this because vacationers and holiday makers are probably going to be a little bit on the uh, side of being a little bit afraid to travel. And, uh, you know, flights probably aren't going to be full. And social distancing will mean that you can't sit in every seat. So if there's a lot less people on these airplanes, uh, ticket prices are probably going to increase. So that's, um, you know, that's a significant fear. And if ticket prices increase, that's going to price a lot of holiday makers out of the market. And, uh, and business travelers are going to have to get this <clears throat> industry back moving again. And I will probably be part of that trend. Uh, and hopefully I'll be able to get back working someday very, very soon uh, in a safe way. Okay, so mobility matters. People will still travel. And this whole thing about being locked indoors 
and doing all kinds of business online is not sustainable. That's my first, by the way, these are my own personal opinions. No one is paying me to say these things. Um, no one has uh, seen what I'm gonna say. So this is just me riffing about the future of travel. These are, these are like the exact same things that I've been talking about for the last couple of weeks in various medias all around Asia to promote Expedition Asia on Discovery Channel coming out Tuesday, June 2nd, 10.50 p.m. I've said that about a thousand times in the last three days. Okay, mobility matters. Number two, touchless travel. Somehow, <laughs> this is hard, somehow everything that we touch at an airport or on an airplane has to become touchless. Think about that. How? I, I don't know. I don't know. You must touch like a thousand things going through an airport and on an airplane. Oh my God. Like, you know, you touch your seat. Sometimes there's like cups and the light, you know, you turn on the light. There's a touch screen. You touch that. People bring you food, knives and forks. Um, go to the bathroom, you know, lock it, touch things in the bathroom. I think the bathrooms are going to be the, the highest, um, biggest danger zones. But you know what? I have a pilot uh, friend of mine, and he actually told me the, that the biggest uh, danger at an airport is actually the security bins. When you go through, once you get your ticket, when you go through security, when you go through your security check to... Uh, go to the terminal to, to board your plane. You have to go through security. You got to take your shoes off. You got to take your laptop out, all that kind of stuff. Those security bins where you put your laptop in and you push them through the X-ray machine, millions of people a year touch them and they never get washed. This, this was, per, this was last year. This guy, this pilot friend told me that. Um, he said like, these are by far the filthiest things in the entire airport because everything else kind of gets washed and things like that. But the, these security bins, yeah, think about that next time you go through security. Um, that's just what he told me. I can't substantiate it. I'm not a virologist or a medical doctor of any kind, but he said that uh, for the most part in airports all around the world, the security bins are never washed. Uh, so yeah, so, Okay, mobility matters and touchless travel. So somehow everything in an airport is going to have to become touchless. Uh, voice controlled, um, door handles, pushing things, uh, you know, touching other people, giving people a ticket, getting back a ticket. Uh, I don't know. Like all of this is probably going to have to change in some way, shape or form. And that's a concern for sure uh, because it's just unclear you know, who's safe, who's not, who's touching what. Um, and, and they're going to have to take that risk out of the equation for people to want to travel again. Like this is, you know, mobility matters, but actually, you know what? Trust matters. People have to trust each other again. The people who work at the airport have to trust the travelers. The travelers have to touch the people, trust the people that work at the airport. Travelers have to trust the people sitting next to them. People sitting next to them have to trust the flight attendants who are serving them things. Or else we're all just going to be walking around in big plastic suits. And that looks terrible and probably feels terrible. Because there was a movie a long time ago called 12 Monkeys with Brad Pitt. And what's his face? Oh my God, I just went totally blank. Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt called 12 Monkeys where they were just walking around in huge spacesuits because of, of a vir virus infection that like destroyed the world. So if you haven't seen 12 Monkeys, very good movie, but terrible. Um, yeah, so yeah, how are we all gonna trust each other again? That's really the big thing that uh, concerns me the most. <clears throat> okay, so touchless travel. How do we get through an airport without touching everything? How do we get onto an airplane without touching everything? How do we get on an airplane, put on our seatbelt, watch some TV and have some food 
and get up and go to the bathroom and then get back to your seat like without touching stuff? Or are we all just going to be like wearing rubber gloves? But even rubber gloves, like if you touch something with a rubber glove and then you touch your face, it's still the same, right? It's just not touching your skin. I don't know how all this is going to work. I'm just thinking out loud. This is me thinking out loud. And uh, yeah, it's concerning. Okay. Uh, today, I was listening to a, a news podcast and they were saying that um, that the, some people are thinking about trying to create like an immunity passport. Um, so you're supposed to get like a, a blood test and to see if you have uh, antibodies to COVID-19. And if you have antibodies, it means maybe you've had COVID-19, uh, in which case you probably won't get it again for a certain amount of time, which no one seems to be clear on. But if you've had it and you have antibodies, then maybe you're clear to travel for a little while. And then maybe you can get some certificate that says that. But then it creates this real like who can travel, who can't travel, who's healthy, who's not healthy, who can pay to have the test, who can't pay to have the test. Then you create this like have and have nots. And uh, and it's it's going to be difficult. Like it's just going to all this is going to do is just increase the gap between rich and poor because rich people are going to be able to travel because they'll get antibody tests and they'll get the certificates. And then the people who can't afford to travel and can't afford to get the health care tests and can't afford to get antibody tests aren't going to travel. And then this, this whole thing is now travel is just going to become this luxury product that very, very few people can afford because there will only be one airline left in the world because all the other airlines will probably go bankrupt. Anyways, immunity passports, crazy, right? But if you take immunity passports one step further, then you have a digital health passport. And I think this will happen for sure at some stage in the future. We'll all have like a digital health passport. Like even my kitten that I rescued here in Istanbul, he has his own passport and he has his vaccinations and he has all the medicine he's ever taken. And he even has a microchip in his back of his neck now. And when it gives off a radio signal and when you scan it, it gives a barcode and it matches the barcode in his passport. And this is my cat, my kitten. He's like two months old. And uh, I've, uh, how long is it going to be before we all have microchips in our necks and people are tracking our vaccinations and making sure we're able to travel safely? If, if they can do it to dogs and cats, we're next. And uh, yeah, this might just be the price we all have to pay before we can get back on an airplane someday, right? I don't know, terrible. So let's talk about a digital health passport and what that looks like. Istanbul is known as a cat city. That is correct. Ugh, that absolutely is correct. Um, so look, what does a digital health passport look like? Well, I'm no expert, but wait one second. Oh yeah, that's better. Sorry guys, just had to take off my shoes. It's very hot today in Istanbul. Um, what does a digital health passport look like? I have no idea, but digital health and passport probably means that it's going to be on your phone. Uh, it's going to have all your health data and it's going to have all your personal data and it's going to be in a cloud and it's going to be checked everywhere, just like your normal passport. But what if you have like a vi you know, what if you have a health condition that uh, isn't, isn't like a respiratory virus? And is that going to be on your health passport? And are people at the airport going to be able to check that? Like privacy is just going to be like out the window. Like everything's going to be on your health passport. Everyone's going to be checking your health passport. Everyone's going to, going to know everything about you all the time. Like if you have diabetes, you're not at risk of giving other people diabetes, but that could be in your health passport and people might have to check that before you can travel. Or if you're HIV positive, that has nothing to do with being able to get on an airplane safely, but that'll be in your health passport. And that might also um, be checked every time you have to travel. And if all of this information is in a cloud, how long until all of that health data is hacked by someone? Yeah, it, uh, it'd be terrible. I'm not sure. Um, where is the kitten? Kitten is sleeping. Thank you, though. Uh, oh, the anti-vax would hate this, probably. 
Um, in Africa, they check whether we have some kind of disease before entering a country. How? Do they test you? Like, do they stick a needle in you and test 300 people getting off the airplane at once? Really? Is that, is that really happening in Africa? I mean, or are they just sticking things up people's noses? But even that test isn't immediate. I mean, I think it still takes an hour or two or three. I don't know. Maybe someone can correct me. Okay, digital health passports. I think it's uh, very scary, but sadly, I think it's probably the future. I think we're going to have a paper passport, which has our nationality and our date of birth and where we were born. And then I also think we're going to have a global health passport. And up until today, I probably thought that was going to be a World Health Organization issued document. But now the United States has removed funding and withdrawn from the World Health Organization. Uh, so, yes, it. it uh, so I guess Americans won't have a health passport that comes from the WHO. So if the Americans are going to go it alone, how many other countries are going to go it alone? OK, let's take a tangent here, shall we? Let's take a tangent here. Global coordination on any of this is going to be a nightmare. If it's one thing that COVID-19 has taught us, it's that all of these countries that we have in this beautiful world of ours do not work together or communicate very effectively at all. Huge gaps in the way people think, the way governments are dealing with this. And, uh, and I guess, you know, to each their own right, you know, governments are elected by the people and they get to decide what to do for those people. But um, like, look at Belarus, you know, Belarus has not gone into lockdown uh, at all. And Belarus Airlines is still flying. And Belarus is even still playing football, soccer, American soccer. Yeah. So Belarus is like totally gone its own way. And I don't know if the country is doing well or not. I don't know if people are going to Belarus and then leaving Belarus and getting sick. I don't know. No one knows anything. The not knowing of all of this is the is really the craziest bit. Lydia saying, if we really want to think deeper about it, it's very scary. Yes, I agree. In a few countries, I've heard that. I haven't been there, though. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. <clears throat> because their body, their decision for the U.S. Maybe. Cham 828, maybe. But, uh, yeah, who knows? <laughs> Hard to know what's going on. So digital health passports, yeah. That is probably our future, probably on a smartphone. But what about people who can't afford a smartphone? What about people who just have like a regular old dial-up phone or, or thumb pad phone, like a Blackberry or a Nokia or something? Do those people not get to have digital passports? Do those people not get to travel? Um, in Belarus, they celebrated some national holiday with a full crowd. Yes, they did. Uh, May Day. I think it was May 1st. No, it was May 10th. May 12th. May 11th. May 11th is the victory day when, uh, when World War II ended. I think they had a big celebration. Moscow tried to have a celebration, but there was no one there. But they spent a lot of money on fireworks that no one got to see. So that is curious indeed. Um, yeah, so how would you feel about carrying around a digital passport? Digital health passport. I don't know. I don't know. Is this really our future? Is this really like, is 2020 going to be the year when all of your privacy really goes out the window? Like I know we've been, we've been working towards that for quite a long time, but maybe this is the year where like passport really does bite the dust. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> um, this is the year when, uh, privacy really does bite the dust. Uh, Mike, seniors would not be able to travel because of health risks and high costs of travel and health insurance. Yeah. Yeah, Mike. Here's another tangent. Insurance. Like, if, if there's uh, viral infections that can put you in the hospital for 14 days on a respirator, which I'm sure is not cheap, um, how much is basic insurance going to be to travel from Canada to the United States to see family or to go on a work trip? Or for me, you know, I want to go film in Switzerland this summer. How much is it going to cost for me to go to Switzerland for two weeks to film? 
not even doing anything dangerous. No rock climbing, uh, no rappelling, uh, no canyoning, nothing. Just walking, trekking on a trail, but somehow have to insure it. And uh, yeah, the flying and stuff like that. Maybe you have to, maybe you're going to have to pay like a higher insurance premium if you fly versus driving. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Driving is so much more dangerous than flying. More people die on the roads every year than on planes. But insuring you to go on an airplane because of a potential respiratory virus could be more expensive than insuring you to drive. Uh, Siddharth, Trump came to know that he wouldn't be elected as president next time, way before he does whatever he wants within this period. I don't know. I can't speculate uh, on the U.S. election. I don't know enough. And to be honest, I don't really follow it that closely. Okay, so look, we've got we've got this idea of digital passports, right? And then we've got this idea of like airlines trying to be safe and keep their passengers safe. But global coordination is my biggest fear because I don't think we all think this situation is the same level of seriousness all around the world. Um, some countries have been hit hard, some countries not so hard. And some countries think that there should be serious testing at airports and maybe other countries don't. And until we all have like a unified response, which one would assume would come from a World Health Organization that's part of the United Nations that every country on the planet has signed up to, it's hard to understand like how we're all just going to be able to get on an airplane and sit next to each other again. Um, it's crazy. Oh, CHAM828, true. It's another expense to consider aside from the vaccination. Yeah. Like CHAM, you think about it, right? We're going to now, we're going to be tested at, and we're going to be tested at the airport. And then we're going to be um, maybe tested before we fly on the airplane. Then when we land, we're going to be tested in the country we arrive in. Um, maybe if you have a fever or you might be sick, you have to quarantine for 14 days. Um, just feel like we're just gonna be tested all the time and all this preparation they're doing at the airports to quarantine people or to test people and all the stuff that the airplanes are doing, it's all going to cost money and it's going to end up reflecting in the ticket price. Like the airports are going to add a whole bunch of new health security measures. And they're going to charge the airlines more for parking their airplanes there. And the airlines are also going to add a whole bunch of new health security measures to their airplanes. And they're going to have to charge the, the, the passenger. So airfares has to get more expensive. The only good thing maybe is that gas prices are so low. So maybe that'll be good. Sid Hartha is asking me, have I ever climbed any mountain with Alex Honnold? Uh, no, Sid Hartha. I've never met Alex. Uh, although I respect him very much and uh, I would never be able to stay up with Alex Honnold. He is a, uh, he is a million times better climber than I will ever be. And I don't think I could ever have the chance to climb with him and actually like stay together with him because I think he would just kind of blow me away. I mean, the thing that would be nice if I could get a climbing lesson from Alex Honnold because uh, he's like a God man and I would love to have a lesson from him. That would be nice. I would love to be a student, but uh, climbing with him, like as an equal partner, no way. Couldn't do it. Could not, not even close to good enough. Uh, Cham828, some people don't believe this COVID is real. Yeah, it's true. Some people do, some people don't. I don't know. Um, how serious is it? How serious isn't it? You know, I think the, the biggest thing is just the uncertainty. Like, it's very clear that people are getting sick and dying. It's very clear that... Uh, People are getting tested positive with it, but um, but it's really just terrible. And um, there's too much misinformation. There's too much fake news. Uh, there's too much news in general about it. And uh, and there's nothing to distract us from the chaos because we're all just stuck at home. And I'm stuck in Istanbul for my ninth week. Okay, Cham828. Yes, and the airlines have to double their prices because they can only carry half of the capacity because of the distancing. That's true. And the airlines are going to have to put in a whole bunch of new measures inside the airplanes to keep us all safer. And 
the airports are going to have to do all kinds of testing when we take off and land to make sure we're not sick before we get on the airplanes. So all of this is also going to add to the ticket prices. So, um, so yeah, so that's going to be expensive. Costs are going to be expensive. So I've got like mobility matters. I got touchless travel. I got digital health passports. I got global coordination. I've got costs. And the last one, oh wait, hold on. Merasabladat. Yes, that's true, Cham828. In Indonesia, people still don't believe COVID is real. Wow. That's crazy. Because the rest of the world somehow does, right? Anyways, I'm not a medical doctor, but I travel a lot. And therefore, I have an opinion about how travel will become more expensive in the future. And I'm giving you that now. Just my opinion. No facts, no inside information, just me being bored in Istanbul, thinking up something to talk about today. I hope you guys are enjoying. Okay, the last one, time. Time, time, time. Flying used to be quick, right? You go to the airport, you fly somewhere, you get there faster. Okay, but now, you used to have to arrive like two hours before an airplane. So now the airlines are telling us that we need to arrive four hours. Wait, hold on here. Mike, Mike is saying that people that don't believe COVID is real is the same people that think the earth is flat. Okay, not bad. Siddharth, if airlines from other countries stopped their fleet for Chinese New Year, the spread could have been way, way less than this. Maybe, maybe Siddharth, but the Chinese New Year was at the end of January. And, uh, and there were cases already in, in early January in Europe and in, I think, North America. So the Chinese New Year was, yeah, end, end of January. Um, people were still, people were probably flying around with this thing like in November and December. I don't know. You know, like, it's going to, this is the problem. I think it's going to be like a good five or 10 years before we ever really know what happened because so many governments will try to cover up their role in what actually happened to protect themselves that will never really probably know the truth how scary is that in a world where there's so much information and there is the digital access to everything that's ever been written or printed on the internet Somehow, in this world of ours that we've created, which is super sophisticated, and I can talk to hundreds of people every day just by talking into my phone right now on Instagram, in this generation, there is zero accountability. Zero. Um, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it'd be great to start commissioning a study about how this started in Wuhan so that we all know 100% how this started. And then we can start talking to every single country in the world and start figuring out how it spread and putting together one timeline by one impartial research group, public, private, global, regional, whatever. Someone has to do this. One would assume it would be the World Health Organization. That's what it's supposed to be there for. But I guess it's been it's been too politicized these last few months, and uh, whether whether they have any credibility anymore, I I can't speak to it. But it's got someone's got to do the, the the tough work. Sid Harth is saying COVID nineteen spread like a forest fire from that point because millions flew there and came back with the diseases and acted as a carrier. Sure, Sid Harth. Any time people were flying, people were getting sick. I was flying during that whole time too. I filmed in Myanmar in February. I went through the Bangkok airport. Um, I, I, I was in Saudi Arabia multiple times. Uh, I was through the Dubai airport like once a week from, from December to March. Yeah, I mean, I fly every week. I flew every week from January until March 14th. On March 14th, I flew to Ethiopia and that was my, my, second last flight and then i flew from ethiopia to istanbul on march 20th 
but from March 14th to January 1st, even before that, in December, I was in, in December, I was in, listen to this, in December, I was in Hong Kong, Singapore, Shanghai, Beijing, Denmark. Then I flew to LA. Then I flew to Toronto for Christmas. Then I flew to Dubai. And then I was in Moscow and St. Petersburg. I mean, I was everywhere. I mean, I, I mean, I could have, I, I could have been sick for a day or two and not really realized that I was very ill and, and, and then maybe I could have given it to people. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I have a great immune system or not. I just, no one knows. That's the problem. That's the biggest problem. There's zero certainty about what's going on right now. And I find it so frustrating. There's so much talking zero accountability and zero certainty and 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 people dying um and people getting sick and of course people being affected by by everything that's going on chris chris just signed on guys chris is amazing he was my mount he was my rock climbing guide in hong kong for my hong kong episode of expedition asia and chris dragged my ass up Lion Rock in Hong Kong. And he's going to say, hey, Ryan, you were great. You climbed really well, blah, blah, blah. But let's be honest, Chris, you made Lion's Rock look like it was easy. And I struggled. But uh, but you did, you did say on camera that you didn't think I was going to make it. And I did a good job. So I appreciate that. Uh, that was a tough one. But that was a good day. And Chris, when I can trek again, and when I can fly again, and when I can come back to Hong Kong again, uh, it could be great if we could climb again, just the two of us, no cameras. I would really like that. And I would love to go back to Lion Rock uh, and try it again without having a drone flying over my head, documenting my struggle. What do you think? Okay, Mike, um, some people have it and never showed any effects of the disease. Yeah, Mike, I totally agree. Um, and I could have just been one of them because I was traveling so much at the time. It's just so scary. Could have been asymptomatic, said Wild Crafted Kitchen. It's upsetting how much we don't know. Yes, that's it. That's the thing. It's so scary how much we just don't know and how much unemployment there is and how much work has stopped everywhere. And still, like, we just don't know. It's so frustrating. Like, and everything is so political. Like, this is the one thing that shouldn't be political. This is science. When did science become political? When did science become hostage to global politics or regional politics or a November election in the United States, for example? Like, this is pure science. This is a viral infection that can be looked at under a microscope and it goes in through the mouth and nose and makes people sick. Some people die. Some people get a slight cold or cough. Some people get the flu for a day or two. And somehow 5 million people have got this illness and hundreds of thousands have died. I don't even know the numbers anymore. People don't, don't take this information from me because uh, I stopped reading the news, man. I'm done with it. Um, Chris. Big love, Ryan. You stay safe. Thank you, Chris. I miss you, buddy. I know things are a little bit challenging in Hong Kong at the moment, but, uh, but yeah, stay safe in Hong Kong. But uh, alien love life, politics, because we are human. We are inside history. Yes. Cham828. When people still take advantage of this situation, it's so pathetic. Yes, Cham. I agree. I agree fully. Um, I just don't know why that is like, you know, like at some stage, someone has to do like the right thing. Um, how about past issue, Bill Gates, who had predicted COVID from 2015? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, lots of people were predicting that there were going to be COVID infections because, um, because so many viruses jump from animals to humans. I, I don't know. All I know is, okay, everything else I have no idea, right? All I know is 
I've been in Istanbul for nine weeks and it's not my home and I don't know anyone here and I don't have any family here and I was in a hotel and now I moved into an apartment and and in nine weeks of me being stuck in Istanbul no one seems to know anything more than we did nine weeks ago and that's scary like like where is the where is the report on exactly how this started nine weeks like you think that there would be people on the ground in wuhan china solving this issue um doing the research you'd think that there would be like a a singular timeline of how this really spread you think that there would be some accountability you know what i read the other day and i hope this is true i really do but um uh, all airlines in the Middle East stopped flying to China. I believe. Uh, if someone's if someone's on the internet right now, can you guys just Google search this and make sure I get the facts right? There's an airline in Iran, and it's called Mahan Airways. M A A N M A apostrophe A. And I think that um, even after everyone stopped flying to China because of the China lockdown. This Mahan Airways was still doing trips in and out of China and uh, was one of the main reasons why uh, Iran had such terrible exposure. Uh, and then that spread obviously to the Middle East. So just if someone is in front of Google, check that out, Mahan Airways. I just read this the other day on the BBC website or maybe it was in a BBC podcast. And if that's true, then shouldn't like some of these companies be criminally liable? I don't know. Like, where's the liability? Where's the, where, <laughs> where are the people taking responsibility for any of this? Um, Siddharth is saying in India, everyone bought things in a panic, which made those marketplaces COVID hotspots and spread COVID faster. Yeah, maybe. Siddharth, it's true. Like anytime people go anywhere, public transportation, the supermarket, the uh, the main markets, um, buses, trains, airplanes, anytime people are together, I guess you have the potential danger to get sick. I, I mean, again, I'm not a doctor. Um, I don't pretend to really understand how any of this is working. I just know that I've been in Istanbul for nine weeks and that Everyone's freaking out that there's a viral infection, but there's so little real information and there's no one kind of stepping up globally and leading this information, you know, war um, with any kind of accuracy. Uh, it's really terrible. Yeah, maybe there should be, right? Maybe there should be some criminal liability to airlines that were breaking uh, the, the law about flying in and out of countries that still had, uh, that were locked down. I, I, I don't know. The liability must be with the government. It's their duty to protect the people and the airline to protect their business. Yeah, but CHAM 828, one thing you gotta know is a lot of these airlines are government owned. A lot of airlines are government owned or par or, or partially uh, government owned. And uh, did anyone do a Google search on Mahan Airways, Iran? Let me know. Miss Tampa, do you think the research and findings would have been shared more readily if China was not ground zero? Miss Tampa, I don't know. I really don't know. I think that, you know, China loves to hide things. If ground zero was in the US, I don't know. Americans are so focused on their freedoms and not wanting to change their lifestyles. Maybe if ground zero was in the U S maybe doctors would have said, Hey guys, don't travel. And Americans would have said, no, we're going to travel and nothing's stopping our lifestyle. Maybe it would have been worse. I mean, there's just, there's no way to know anything like, and, and, but so many people on the news are so focused on like knowing everything but actually no one's giving us any like real information. And, and for me, my whole world is travel. 
And I, I'm very lucky that I get to travel and make a living. And now like traveling is, it's not dead, but it's going to be terrible moving forward. Um, and the, the scary thing is, is that people who have a vaccine or have some immunity, it's going to be people from wealthy nations that can afford the immunity tests or can afford a health passport. So it's just going to divide the world between rich and poor and within each country. It's been, uh, it's been tough. Siddharth, I was flying around the Middle East in the UAE in January, but still there was tension on Iran versus U.S. issue, not the novel coronavirus issue. Yeah, but Siddharth, in February, Iran got absolutely destroyed by coronavirus. Um, they, got, uh, they were like the biggest carriers, and people were traveling from Iran into Bahrain, into Saudi Arabia, and into the UAE. So a lot of people believe that uh, Iran was kind of the hot, the flashpoint for the Middle East. So did anyone check on the Mahan Airways? Anyone checking on that? I can't Google search and do an Instagram live because I'm on, I'm on my phone. I can't, I can only get one screen at a time. Mahan Airways, Iran. Let's find out what, uh, what some reliable news sources say. Uh, Mary, what's the hardest thing you've been through as of now? Um, Mary, I think this has been the hardest thing probably. Yeah, I mean, it is terrible. Okay, Church Santo says, it says, ArabNews.com on March 16th, 2020, Mahan Air continued to fly to four Chinese cities in three weeks and may have continued, continued to the steep rise. Wow. So there you go. So um, March 19th, March, March 19th, 2020, uh, all airlines in the Middle East basically stopped working and Mahan Airways went for another three weeks. How do you like that? Huh? Um, Trump still doesn't wear a mask in a country where the spread is the highest. A bit is criticizing ex-vice president on wearing a mask. Yeah, Siddhartha, you know, politics is politics. It's crazy. Cham828, they flew to China despite the outbreak at least 55 times. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's many reasons why we are where we all are at the moment. But, you know, there's probably a few airlines that did similar things like this. And, uh, and it definitely uh, is difficult. It revealed that February 4th to 22nd, Mahan Air flew at 55 times to Beijing, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. Okay. Yeah. Um, during most of that time, Emirates was only flying to Beijing, actually. So they had shut down flights to Shenzhen and Guangzhou and Hong Kong and Shanghai. I used to live in Shanghai, and in February, they had closed the flights to Shanghai, just flying in and out of Beijing, all of February, actually. So Mahan Airways, good for them. Um, yeah, I mean, guys, I think the one thing I want you to take away from this is, is, um, the uncertainty of it all is just soul destroying. It really is. Uh, the uncertainty of what has happened in the last few months, the uncertainty of what is currently happening and the uncertainty of what is happening in the future. Um, the future of travel, the future of mobility is all uncertain. And some people are going to be like, oh, Ryan, it'll be okay. And other people are like, oh, the world is going to burn. You know, those are the two extremes, you know, well, um, where am I? I don't know, somewhere in the middle, maybe. Um, but definitely feeling that the freedom and the excitement of traveling in 2019 will not be felt again for a very long time. And, and, uh, and yeah, I just, I just feel it's really silly. And, and you know, what? you know, it's really, you know, it's really funny. Can I use that word funny? You know, what's really funny is I, I saw some American news the other day and they're like, it's okay. You know, the world will be saved we're going to create a vaccine and then everything will be okay. And I'm like, man, even if you have a vaccine created by the smartest virologists in the world and it works, then thank you. 
that's an amazing first step. But you have to get that vaccine to every single person in the world in order for us all to be safe again. How long do you think that's going to take? Do you think that's going to be like a one month thing or like a 10 year thing? So I'm quite concerned about this. Uh, there was an Iranian couple who are medical professionals and they had returned home to New York at which time she found out that she was positive for the coronavirus. Okay, great. Even F1 planned to conduct a race March 15th at Melbourne, but canceled it last minute as a few tested positive. Yeah, Siddharth, yeah, I do remember that. I do remember the F1 were going to go ahead and do their races, even without people in the stands. The F1 had considered doing races, even without people in the stands, just because of the television rights. Um, same reason now the footballers are going to, the footballers are going to get back to playing, uh, even without fans in the crowd. So how crazy is that? Although I'm not really a sports fan, so I don't really, I don't really know. I just, I just wish that, uh, Everything is pending. School, job, business, travel. You're right, champ. Yeah. I, I think they'll come out with a vaccine soon, but I don't think the vaccine solves anything. Like, you know, like, okay, you will get vaccinated and then some people won't get sick, but not everyone will get vaccinated and then some people will still get sick and then those people will still interact with other people who can still make other people sick. Like, everyone needs to be vaccinated. Yes, I agree. A vaccine would give people confidence. That is true, but it could also give people a false confidence. You know, like as these cities are now opening up, like I'm in Istanbul, right? And on Monday, the whole city opens up again, restaurants, bars, cafes, everything in Istanbul opens up on Monday, June 1st. And I'm scared a little bit because now everyone's been indoors for like eight, 10 weeks like me, you know, we can go to the grocery store and stuff like that. But I'm just really afraid like people are going to start going to bars again. People are going to be not social distancing again. And if there's a huge like rise in, in, in cases or people are getting sick, um, they're going to have to shut down the city like a second time. And then, and then I'll, just, I'll just live in Istanbul for the rest of my life because I'll never be able to get out. Uh, but it's kind of scary. Like, where are we all in this journey? We're all going through this journey together. And yet there's really so little reliable information. Yes, the second wave champ, the second wave. Well, not even the second wave. This could still be part of the first wave, but then in October or November or December, as the Northern hemisphere goes back into winter, we could get into some second wave when people are going back indoors and touching everything again. It's very, very confusing. And, uh, it was with the Iranian couple having the virus when it started to spread in New York. Uh, you know, you can't blame one couple. I mean, New York is such a global travel hub. People were coming from all over the world to New York, just like people were coming from all over the world to Dubai, just like people were coming all over the world to London. Um, you know, you, it's, it definitely wasn't just one, one person or one couple that, that brought it. Um, not, not in a global city like New York. Yeah, a vaccine would give people some confidence. I agree. Yeah, that could be good. It would be nice if we could have a vaccine, but in Manila, we haven't had a mass testing yet. Yeah, I haven't been tested yet. I'm sitting in my apartment in, in uh, Istanbul. I haven't gone to the hospital or been tested at all. I'm just sitting here waiting. Waiting for what? What's the next step? I have no idea. Um, if every country's citizens were informative as Taiwan's citizens on this virus, they could have stopped it. So Siddharth, yeah, I mean, a lot of countries have done well with their information, with their trust in government, and uh, and with their uh, public health. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, I mean, South Korea didn't even close, didn't even have a shutdown. You know, people still went to work. And Japan is like, didn't even, I think, have a shutdown. They had like a state of emergency, but people were still going to work. So, I don't know. No one knows, right? Mike is saying it'll be realistic 18 to 24 months before there's a vaccine. We will be issued here in Canada. All the testing is happening. Yeah. 
Uh, UAE was on peak traveling in the start of 2020, but yeah, I mean, I was, like I said, I was in the Dubai airport every week from December 28th to February 14th. In Jakarta, COVID happened on the second week of March, but I'm quite sure weeks and months before it already existed. We still went out, everything was normal. Suddenly changed in one day, confusing, yeah. Cases weren't high, yeah. I mean, this is the thing, like, no one seems to be able to give us any real information. Yeah, I mean, this was probably with us in December or November, right? But, but the world didn't change in December or November. And now all of a sudden, um, everything's closed. Yeah, it's hard to know. All we can do is what? Sit, uh, listen to our public health officials, sit and wait, I guess. But anyways, just remember that uh, I am not a medical doctor. I have no idea what's really happening in this world. I have no idea what's gonna happen later. Oh, thank you, you like my crazy hair, beautiful. Um, I have no idea what's gonna happen later this year, but I do know that travel is gonna become very difficult. And I did mention that mobility matters, touchless travel, digital health passports, uh, immunity tests, global coordination, costs will increase, and time will be crazy. Time. If I have to go to an airport five hours before a flight, and then I have to stay at the airport like two hours after I land to be tested, I'm not gonna fly. That's crazy. Can you imagine? Um, in India, they imposed lockdown, weren't as many cases, but now is releasing the lockdown when the cases are in the peak. Yeah, Siddharth, I don't know, man. Every government seem to, seems to have its own plan. Every government seems to have its own system of how things are moving and what they think is right to do. And I appreciate all of us having this dialogue because, you know, the confusion of it all is what's really exhausting. The confusion of it all is, is what I find so painful. You know, we're, we're now into June. Monday is June 1st. And there's no global leadership on this at all. Zero. Here in the Philippines, people are more scared to die of hunger than the virus. Yes, I believe that then the airport check-in would become a layover. Yes, Siddharth, that is funny. Yeah, you have to get to the airport 12 hours before your flight, get tested 10 times, and then fly one hour, and then layover again when you arrive, get tested 10 times again, and then you can go and do your business meeting, and then you have to fly back. It's crazy. In Jakarta, people are still out, yeah. I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe COVID is just something that we're all just gonna have to deal with forever. Um, I don't know. Ryan, has there been an upside or a silver lining for you in the pandemic? Um, good question. I think uh, I've enjoyed making online content. I've enjoyed my COVID calls, my Instagram lives. I've enjoyed meeting new people online. Uh, I've enjoyed making more YouTube content and staying more connected with my digital audience. Um, but... I'd rather be working. I'd rather be filming somewhere or climbing some mountain or making bigger stories. Um, testing should be increased in order to stop the spread like South Korea. Yeah, maybe. Obviously, I mean, think that, that'd be a good start, right? That'd be a good start. Okay, guys, uh, that's it for me today. Um, good chat. The future of travel is not looking good. And the lack of information and global leadership and just the uncertainty of it all is driving us all a bit mad. And uh, I appreciate this dialogue that we all had today. And please remember, we're all not doctors and we're all confused and we all don't really know what's going on. So everyone just needs to stay safe. Keep listening to your own public health officials and just keep trying to, to, do, uh, to do what you can and I uh, hope everyone's okay. And look, if you, uh, if you do like these COVID calls, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. They are all there. 
Uh, my YouTube channel is Ryan J. Pyle. And uh, yeah, we'll be back online tomorrow with guests. Yeah, so thanks for joining me today and sharing these ideas. Stay safe.